I'm good and rested, and I'm glad to be out of the smoke-infested environment of Laughlin. Uh, the oh, Laughlin hotels. Laughlin is very, very smoky indeed. Yeah. Oh, I remember my uh, last encounter with Laughlin. I was there for something that turned out to be pretty fun, and that was the Star Wars USA conference ran by Paula Harris. And um, so it was nice to see her again and some of our other friends. And uh, and the Laughlin is where the UFO Congress used to be held, for those listeners who don't know, because some don't. Um and so Bob Brown, who used to run the conference, you know, uh, helped out Paula. And uh, they they did a conference that was a little different. It was more around consciousness. They had some channelers talking about ghosts. Uh, Paul Davids was doing a, a ghost kind of thing. Um, but they also had people who channeled ghosts and aliens and uh, an astrologer. So it was a little different in that way uh, where it wasn't all UFOs. But... Um, it was uh, pretty well attended, I think, that uh, what they were expecting. It seems like they felt uh, they had the number of people they were looking for, and it was it was uh, fun to see everybody. That's great. It sounds like it was a, a good event. And, yeah. You know, I mean, that is the plus about Laughlin, that uh, it's more affordable. It's a, a very affordable place to hold an event. So mm -hmm. they seem to get the turnout they were looking for. So congratulations. Good for them. Yeah, and Paula's really got it down. She does do a great – she's a, a great organizer and runs a pretty tight ship, and uh, so uh, it, it went – flowed pretty well. Um, so she's gotten running these conferences down pretty, pretty good. Now, a lot so of – So not to, not to poke too much fun here, but uh -huh. uh, just, just like the uh, Travis Walton event? I'm kidding. <laughs> I was thinking about a diplomatic way to say it, but I think like we said last week, alien abductees perhaps are not the best people to run a conference. But uh, no, this one was uh, on schedule and, you know, uh, it was uh, it was very it, well organized, uh, whereas uh, Travis's conference is a lot of fun, a lot of great content, but uh, he struggles in the the organizational side. <laughs> He'll get there, and we'll help him. We love Travis. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we are helping them, and you know we'll do anything we can for them because, of course, we love those guys. Yeah, the whole team that helps put together the Travis Conference, we love. Um, speaking of loving people, I have a new good buddy who is just super awesome, and probably you know beyond you know getting to meet with some old friends, Paul David. So it was really great to see him again, and we watched his documentary, um, but. Uh, someone I had not met before is Chase Kletsky. And, uh, of course, last week we talked with Richard Dolan, and Richard said, you need to talk to Chase. So I did. And uh, we interviewed her, and she is our guest. So she was a star team manager uh, with MUFON. She is no longer with MUFON, and we talk about that in the interview um and she also had this amazing case that she investigated that i've heard about um but to hear it from her firsthand is really uh something else and then to meet her and to me for her to be such a credible and intelligent person and uh, i think a great investigator because you know when she tells her story, it's like uh, she definitely, you can tell she's a, a MUFON, you know, star team person and why, because she's very careful about how she does everything uh, and uh, to, to keep the um, the uh, integrity of the case and, uh, to protect it. And so I was really impressed with her. I think she's great. I'm really excited about this interview. I think you all are going to love it. But uh, that was one of the highlights of Paula's conference for me is uh, is meeting Chase. And uh, so I'm really excited about this interview. I can't wait to hear it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we didn't debate like Richard and I did, but I got to clear up and find out from her, her mouth, you know, about some of the MUFON things that uh, Richard and I were talking about. And uh, I don't know. It I, I feels like. Uh, maybe some of her stuff, uh, what she has to say is misinterpreted and she does not feel like uh, – she certainly has said that uh, she uh, doesn't have any uh, negative feelings towards MUFON currently, um, that 
it was uh, just a not move on itself that she had a problem with even and she clarifies that so that's great well she's the best one to hear it from yep exactly so i was gonna say straight from the horse's mouth but that doesn't sound very nice that sounds like i'm calling it's really her a not a nice expression yeah i no. think i think he made the right decision avoiding that one yeah and she's a she's a nice pretty lady and and there, no uh no real uh similarities with a horse at all <laughs> silent you don't know I'm what to say. I'm staying away from that one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's wise. Okay, well, before we start to talk with Chase and uh, get into this awesome interview, Jason and I review the UFO news of the week. Ba -ba -da -ba. And so, Jason, do you want to uh, begin with discussing your favorite news piece of the week? I will go ahead and begin, Alejandro, mm -hmm. and I'm going to... Jump in here with a story that we just posted today, actually, because it's a UFO photo, and we haven't had any uh, UFO photos for a while. We've had uh, you know some here and there, but this one uh, was making the rounds today. We see this photo. This comes from uh, the English city of Manchester. Now, this has some details in it that we hear in several cases where this individual, he was staying over at a friend's house. He slept at a friend's house, and at about 10 o'clock in the morning, he woke up, and he had no idea why, but he felt compelled to walk over to the window. Something drew him to the window. And as he was at the window, he felt compelled to take a photo out the window. So he pulled out his cell phone, took two photos, and in these photos there is a sort of disc-shaped UFO, this illuminated object that seems to be hovering over the city. Now, the witness says that two days later, he felt compelled to look at the photos he took. And when he reviewed those photos, he says he felt this same uh, feeling. That he describes it as a lunar pole um, when he looked at these photos. Now, I hate to be a uh, a spoiler here, but these photos to me, there's nothing in them to indicate that they are anything but very ordinary reflection of a light from inside the room where the witness stood. He did take the photos inside the room, so he was taking the photo through a window, and that's exactly what this, this object in the sky looks like. It looks like a reflection of a light in the room, but... The biggest problem with this story, Alejandro, are the details that are being reported in this case because they conflict. Mm. So what is being reported is that this mysterious object that the witness photographed, um, it hovered in the same location for a half hour and then vanished. Okay, so keep that in mind. There's also the detail being reported that the witness didn't see this object until two days later when he reviewed his photos. So let me ask you this, Alejandro. Mm -hmm. If that, in fact, is what happened, how could he possibly know that the object hovered for a half hour? Very, very good question. Uh, just a sort of investigative question that uh, I would expect from you. Well, I'm so glad you hold me in such high regard but you know we, we don't know because there are multiple uh media outlets reporting this story uh most of the details are the same some differ we don't know which details are in fact the accurate retelling of this incident but uh, there are the discrepancies there and like i pointed out in my personal opinion this looks very much like a simple reflection in the window the witness um Apparently was asked about that, and he says, I really don't think it's a reflection because uh, he points out the saucer-shaped object and says that light's coming from it. Um, there are two lines he identifies as coming out of the bottom and talks about light reflecting off the clouds as well. And that's what he's seeing when he looks at these photos. So he doesn't believe it's a reflection, but uh, that's what it looks like to me, and that's just my opinion. 
Yeah, you know, um, that the hard thing is yeah, you make a great point and uh when pictures are taken inside of of a house uh with through a glass uh, we see this so often that um that's what makes it hard to uh not rule that out as most likely the answer and uh it's unfortunately there's the conflicting info too because that kind of indicates this guy really is willing to exaggerate um, in order to get people to believe his way uh, that it is something unusual. They are definitely red flags here that mm-hmm. can't, you know, you, you do have to consider in uh, looking at this case and deciding what you want to believe. Again, when it mm-hmm. comes down to uh, witness sightings like this, really, you're depending a lot, relying almost completely on witness testimony here. Yeah. And because we don't know exactly what the uh, real witness testimony is here, what, right. what details are accurate and which are not, um, you know, it's really hard to consider any of them. So what are you going to do? I mean, we've got this photo to look at. We've got the few details here and there, but based on the photo alone, um, I'm going with reflection here. But again, that's just my personal opinion based on thousands of photos we see every year. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, interesting story. It's good to have a photo one um, because, it, like you said, it has been a while. Yeah, it has. I mean, there have been a couple um, of the sightings submitted to move on that have had some interesting images. And I was going to bring that up, too, Alejandro, that uh, one of the stories that we talked about a week or two ago, maybe it was just a week ago, where uh, a guy took a picture of like a bluish UFO like hovering over his neighbor's tree. Do you remember that one? Mm, kind of. Trying to remember where it was. I think it was in Virginia where a witness uh, photographed a UFO over the neighbor's tree. In the photo, you just see this kind of like bluish glob over the tree. Um, I'll need to look into that. I, I should have pulled this up before the show, but uh, one of the local MUFON investigators there reached out to me and let me know that they were able to identify and close that case. Mm. And, uh, you know, conspiracy theorists will think this is too convenient, but they did find that uh, a nearby, one of the neighbors, I guess, their kid had a uh, remote-controlled quadcopter and got it stuck in the tree. Oh, really? Yeah. Yep. So case solved. Yes, sir. So I want to talk about the big UFO news of the week. I'm going to do that a lot this show because it's just fun. Because um, as we reported about, and this was really exciting, that uh, American University, which is a big deal, you know, world leaders go talk there and everything, was having a forum on UFOs, a panel on UFOs with some very credible people, with uh, Leslie Kane. Uh, who wrote, uh, you know, I always get this mixed up, but UFOs, generals, pilots, and very credible dudes go on the record. Um, <laughs> but also... I like that one. Uh, but you know, very credible people. Uh, I always forget, you know, exactly, you know, what the, the sequence is. But uh, And also Dr. Richard Haynes, who worked for, for NASA and now has a group called NARCAP. Um, you know, these two people are... Some of the the premier people in the field, I think Leslie is. Uh, I'm I'm a huge Leslie Kane fan. I mean, I think she's doing everything right to uh, bring credibility to this field and uh, being very rigorous and careful about paying attention to um, the credibility, which is important for the mainstream. And obviously, she's being very successful uh, with uh, her approach. Another researcher who is there is Tom Carey, and I have a great respect for Tom Carey and Don Schmidt. Uh, really, they are some of the premier Roswell researchers out there, and they've done some incredible work getting some uh, of the many, many credible witnesses to talk about uh, their experiences uh, and knowledge about Roswell. And so I was extremely excited for this um, and very happy that it was it was happening Uh, The news that came out of it is Tom Carey says he has a smoking gun and he's got pictures of an alien. 
Uh, pretty shocking news, of course, especially because it's a pretty lofty claim. Uh, the issue is he doesn't have those pictures. He couldn't show the audience, and they're just going to have to wait till n- next year or later on, uh, to- sometime next year, to-, to see them. But he did say they had them analyzed and discovered they were from 1947. So the unfortunate part is it's kind of twofold. I kind of feel uh, two ways about it. First of all, Leslie Kane has said, um, I had nothing to do with Tom Carey being here because she obviously uh, was not uh, enthusiastic about Tom Carey's announcement. And I can't blame her because really it's difficult to go to the press who is very visually oriented and to say, I have something, but I can't show you. It's the smoking gun, but you're going to have to wait. And that's kind of what people, the mainstream, expects from UFO researchers, making lofty claims with no evidence to back it. So I think in that respect, it's kind of uh, didn't help the credibility of the, the panel. However, it has now created a lot of buzz around these photographs for which they say they will reveal. So now he's got to kind of put up or shut up. He's going to have to, he's the pressure's on for him to produce these pictures and along with some very v- incredible evidence supporting that they're real. So uh, the pressure's really on for Tom Carey. If he pulls it off, and, uh, you know, after creating this buzz about it by mentioning it, then maybe uh, he'll he'll definitely redeem himself. But uh, he's going to have to have some pretty substantial evidence. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think anything he does, uh, you know, any way he chooses to, to handle this, if he does, in fact, have what he claims to have, um, any way he chooses um, is going to upset somebody he's not going to be able to appease everybody it's not going to be mm-hmm. the right way according to everybody you know we uh if he does have something and he releases it you know by putting out a new book or something and including the photos people will accuse him of you know just wanting to profit and not not uh, sharing this earth-shattering information with everybody because everybody has the right to know and it belongs to the people you know we hear the, those claims all the time um and yeah i mean his his announcing it and then saying, oh, uh, well, I don't have it here. It sounds like a, a kid at the schoolyard, you know, making a claim like, oh, yeah, well, I've got a $100 bill. And his friend saying, oh, yeah, well, show us. Well, I don't have it here. It's at home. <laughs> I, you know, why make the announcement at all? It's creating unnecessary hype, I think. And like you said, it's it's really not not doing anybody any favors. So, Yeah, I mean, I felt so torn at first. I was like, oh, my gosh, this was a huge misstep. And then I think, well, you know, uh, if I had some photos that I thought were real and, and maybe I just wanted to wrap up some research before I, and I couldn't show them in time for having, when do you have a platform as big as this? It's rare. So maybe I would do the same thing Tom did. I'm not sure. But they've got to have, you know, photos alone, even if they do feel, you know, discovered they're from 1947, that you know, you've got to do more than that to prove that they're just not, they're not fake. They're not dummies or something. So, um, I mean, at this point, photos alone are just not enough anymore. You got to have some, you know, you got to have maybe, uh, a, an officer, you know, a colonel or a, a major or a, a general saying, yes, these are real. You know, I mean, you have to have something pretty big to support, uh, and to, Testify that, you know, these photos are more than just a, a doll, uh, even if they are from 1947. So uh, I agree with you. Absolutely. I mean, there, mm-hmm. there are a lot of people out there who, you know, like to get to that first step and hear the magical date. And they're all, aha, that's all we needed to hear. That is definitive proof. No, that's a step in the right direction. You can't mm-hmm. just give up there. I mean, especially for people who are willing to believe that this is a grand government conspiracy, the huge cover-up that took place then, everything that supposedly happened in Roswell in 1947, um, the, the people who would be willing to accept the paper as proof, uh, that seems kind of silly to me. Those people especially would be the ones who would say, hmm, this is most likely, or 
there's a large possibility that this is something that the government staged and took pictures of mm -hmm. for this very purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, another thing that we found was uh, from. So like, I'm with you. You you need yeah. to go go further. There needs to be more than just these pictures are from 1947. That doesn't right. doesn't do anything. It does right. something, but it's not it's not the nail in the coffin. Yeah, I guess the only one other point that I, I like to leave people with is that uh, just that I feel we should give him Tom the benefit of the doubt. There was a Facebook posting on Leslie Kane's Facebook uh, after she had said, you know, I had nothing to do with it. A student came in, uh, someone who said they were a student, part of the honors program, who helped decide who was going to be on the panel, and they said uh, that uh, the that uh, some could say that having Tom on there damaged the credibility of the group, but what they were looking for was something that um, highlighted all the different parts of UFO investigation, kind of referring to Tom Carey as fringe, where really he's not very fringe when it comes to this field. Uh, you know, there's much more fringe out there, and uh, he's, a, he's a pretty conservative researcher. So I, for one... Um, do at least give them the benefit of the doubt because I think Tom and Don, uh, who work together, uh, co-authored the books together, are great researchers. So I'm I'm hopeful. Well, I'm going to agree with you here and say that I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. And you made a very good point that, you know, I don't know what I would do given the similar circumstances. Had this huge thing that I'm working on, uncovering, researching, in possession of possibly, but more work needs to be done. Given that kind of platform and knowing that I'm probably not going to have another platform uh, of that scale anytime in the foreseeable future, I might use the opportunity to make the announcement. Yeah. You know, you're going to get, get some backlash. It's not going to be what everybody wants, but – Maybe you go for it, and and Tom apparently felt that that was the place to do it. So I'm with you. I mean, I can't say exactly what I would do if I were in the similar similar situation. So yeah. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. We'll see what comes of it. We'll see how he handles the actual reveal, and see see where it goes from there. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about one more story before we're done, and uh, because I think this is really interesting, and I think it is important. I think uh, it feels it's more important than it really is, but I think it's uh, worth noting and something we should think about, and that's when it comes to abduction, in that there was a story in Scientific American uh, regarding a new study about something called accidental awareness, and this is when people wake up uh, during surgery, which one can imagine is, is extremely terrifying. That would be awful. That is a total nightmare scenario. Supposedly there have been horror movies based on this concept. Uh, however, this researcher drew a similarity between accidental awareness, which is it's so traumatic that often people do not remember it consciously after it happens, but it comes back in these terrifying flashbacks over time, bits and pieces, which is called trauma memory, which is something that happens during traumatic experiences. And it's something that uh, alien abductees report, you know, having these flashbacks. If you saw fire in the sky, Travis Walton experienced, you know, you, these uh, flashbacks. So she's drawing a similarity. And in particular, she uses uh, the Betty and Barney Hill experience as a case study, showing that uh, Barney Hill, for example, did have a tonsillectomy and uh, that uh, per and the descriptions of what he said happened on board the craft craft during his abduction was uh, similar to a surgery and so she's showing that perhaps some of these alien abductees are actually having flashbacks of uh, accidental awareness during a surgery and misinterpreting them as alien in nature I think that's a really interesting theory, and I think alien abductee researchers need to be cognizant of this because it's very possible this could be happening. However, she does go on to say that this study she is talking about in accidental awareness, not one of the hundreds of people that they had interviewed uh, believed they had uh, been abducted by aliens. So she had no example of this to show at all. So it was just a guess. The other problem is that she was using Betty and Barney Hill as a model, whereas Betty Hill remembers communication, 
that's not something that happens with the accidental awareness as she describes it. Um, Betty Hill and Barney Hill also saw a UFO for a period of time prior associated with this event. So that's something that wouldn't be related. So I don't think that uh, accidental awareness explains the Betty and Barney Hill experience. Uh, also, there's two people that had these memories. So two people at the same time having this accidental awareness issue. Um, and she didn't substantiate that Betty Hill had had any sort of surgery prior to the events. So I think there's many reasons this accidental awareness does not fit the Betty and Barney Hill uh, experience. However, it could fit others. Uh, we actually heard from, on our Facebook, I heard from somebody who said, I am an alien abductee and I have also experienced accidental awareness. However, she says she feels that she can distinctly tell the difference and that she is not mixing these things up. So I think it's really interesting and and, it, and uh, it's something to, to be aware of. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. I think this could certainly explain some cases, but it certainly doesn't explain all of them by a long shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I wanted to throw that one out there. And I'm glad you pointed out the the, the issues there with the uh, the Hill case being a bad comparison. Right. Yeah, because that one doesn't fit. And she, the uh, lady writing the paper, conveniently leaves out all of these other facts related to the story. Uh, so, I, which I, I think kind of is a little bit disingenuous. I think if she would have looked harder, she probably could have found cases that more closely fit her uh, scenario. Right. Yeah, I, I think it. That was a little, little bad on, on their part. But uh, you know, I do think that studies like this do have their place. They, they are important, and yeah. like you said, something that people should be aware of. Yep. So, do you have any other UFO news you want to talk about, Mr. Jason? I have no more UFO news that I want to talk about, Mr. Alejandro. Okay, then without further ado, let's talk to Chase Kletsky. I am very excited to have on the show. Chase Kletsky. Did I say it right? You absolutely did. Just learned how to say it, so a little bit of education for everybody. <laughs> because awesome. we're hearing your name more and more these days, it seems, and I think we're going to hear your name more and more. I mean, you did a great talk here for uh, for Paula's conference, the Starworks USA. Well, thank you so much for that compliment, and it is so much pleasure to be here with you today, get to talk. This is going to be awesome. Yeah, this is kind of fun because um, just... I think even a week ago today, I was in a room like this speaking with Richard Dolan. And he said, well, you got to talk to Chase. And I'm like, perfect chance. All right. I will <laughs> talk to Chase. He's so awesome. I, uh -huh. uh, everyone knows I'm very, very fond, fiercely loyal to uh -huh. uh, Richard. He's amazing. He's a great friend. And I believe one of our quarterbacks out here, always out front. And, you know, he's contributed so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's a... Uh, He's a lot of fun, and uh, we definitely got into some um, some discussion and debate and stuff. But he's—I've known him for so long that you know we can do that and be cool still. So uh, one of the things I want to talk about is kind of move on in your relations with them because that's what Richard and I had talked about. However, before that, I want to kind of get to know who you are. So what got you into this field? It was an interest that started as a teenager, you know, just reading a couple books, and it started with Chariots of the Gods, mm -hmm. and it just kind of grew from there, and, and I really, it was the first time I heard about a UFO phenomena, and, you know, just asking those type of questions, and being raised the way I was, we didn't ask those kind of questions, you didn't think mm -hmm. like that, so to actually almost be given permission through this book to ask out of the box questions and not be afraid to say, well, wait a minute, what if they mean this instead? Or what if and could it be? It was amazing. And of course, for some reason, just really the UFO issue has been a huge passion. Although I uh, investigate paranormal or um, cryptids, if you don't know what it is, I'll go look basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I am always a ufologist first. That's where my biggest love is. Mm -hmm. Real quick. That's cool that you do other things, and I think people, a lot of people know, you know, because I do Huffington Post paranormal. I'm also into all aspects of the paranormal. It seems like more and more UFO re researchers are kind of opening up and, and researching a lot of different things. 
I think it's important because we're also finding threads mm -hmm. of similarities between cases and uh, something that you might think was a ghost could uh, be actual extraterrestrial visitation or contact and you know they're just confused issues um, there's also the theory that this is dimensional you know they may not be getting here on a full tank of gas and a red bull you know it might be a dimensional uh, contact or transversion mm -hmm. so you know it, it's just an exciting time to be a ufologist as we're making these discoveries mm -hmm. closer for some reason oops When did you begin uh, investigations? 1994. Mm -hmm. And what got you started into it? What, did you do ghosts first and then get into UFO or vice versa or I both? I think it was uh, meeting a group of people and just started investigating UFOs. And when I say investigating, it was probably more, you know, going to the library, uh, reading of these sites uh, and event zones and taking trips mm -hmm. and just kind of getting out there and seeing for myself the areas, which of course led into uh, one of those finds when the internet and you get your first computer and yes, I'm that old. <laughs> and, you know, the first thing I typed in when I got my AOL account set up was mm -hmm. UFOs. And of course, I found MUFON, and mm -hmm. that's exactly was shocked that there was investigators and, and this whole organization. So I joined them in 1996. Mm -hmm. So quite some time ago. Yes. So your first official investigations into the paranormal was with MUFON. Um, as far as UFOs. Uh, or in general, any paranormal investigations. Yeah, yeah, I didn't get into paranormal investigations until about 2008, 2009. Okay. So I was strictly nuts and bolts UFO investigator up until that time. Was it your belief in UFOs that kind of opened you up to uh, other aspects of the paranormal? Yes, and I also believe some of it may have to do with the fact that I am a, an investigator of things that are not supposed to exist, mm -hmm. that I started getting calls asking me to investigate paranormal uh -oh. and other things. So it, it was more availability and skills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, the interest obviously was there because you, know, you get to go to intriguing places. Although a lot of our equipment is the same, tri-fields, uh, black lights, things that we use in UFO investigations easily transverse, but they had some cool things that I thought might be important to bring into our UFO investigations and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that? Because I think it's interesting too that there are similar technologies that we all use to investigate these different aspects of the paranormal. So uh, it seems like, you know, electromagnetic fields, uh, infrared are aspects of both phenomena. It is. And I think this is why today we have opportunities to get more of that data and, and scientific study from the greats like Jacques Vallée that has said this is dimensional and they suspected this for a long time because of the similarities in everything from a battery drain. We hear this on paranormal investigations but also on UFO events. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, what do you make of that? Do you have any theories on why those those similarities exist? I, I think maybe uh, one of the theories that I probably most believe is that when they're using energies and mm -hmm. if they are coming in, they, they're grabbing uh, ambient type, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, the electro electromagnetics, the electricity in the air, the static mm -hmm. electricity. It's why we now carry uh, static alerts, which are basically these little devices that will tell you if there's an electrical strike. So it could really? be anything from, you know, a golf course, they're required to wear them, and um, if you're a lifeguard at a public pool. and they were explaining this to me while we we're on the golf course one time and I'm, I was like, wow, you know, if, it, if it's taking electric charges and bursts of them through electrical strikes of lightning, I wonder if we could pick up something like that while we're investigating this type of phenomena. And sure enough, these alerts will go off or these alarms will go off and someone will catch an orb or a shadow figure mm -hmm. or some sort of uh, detectable or measurable anomaly through you know a trifield meter where you're getting a reading of EMF. Mm -hmm. so, How cool! Yeah. See, I um, 
It seems like it used to be that UFO people didn't like the ghost stuff so much, but I think that's kind of easing up a little bit. So I, I do try to separate the two, but I'm going to ask anyway, what has been, like, what was maybe your first real cool, your favorite ghost hunt what, or story? Probably it has to be Octagon Hall, and that is mm-hmm. in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. It's a Civil War museum. It's an amazing it's a, it's, a, it's a notorious building, mm-hmm. and it literally is an octagon. It has a huge history back in the Civil War, and it's known as a hot spot. Well, we hear that a lot in our field, and yeah. but to actually go to a place and experience activity and be measuring it and be busy and excited all night it was Octagon Hall, to me, is not only legitimate, but my first OMG moment in Paranormal where I'm like, cool. oh, my gosh, we can't test this we can measure this we can photograph this Mm -hmm. did you have an experience did you see something or or hear something oh yes many times on the paranormal investigation they seem to be more common Mm -hmm. uh, when you're doing these and I don't know why where Mm -hmm. maybe it's because as UFO investigators we're usually after the event we're we're brought in Mm -hmm. uh, when people report something that's already happened it's very rare you get where the witnesses or the investigators become a witness right. in a UFO investigation where paranormal activity um, usually resides. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of stays in a place, so mm-hmm. it's, it's a little easier to capture. So, like, what have you experienced? Did you hear something or see? or? Uh, we, we've done a lot. I've done a lot of paranormal investigations, and it's... Um, we've seen shadow people. Um, oh, wow. Definitely uh, odd things coming out of uh, voice boxes, which I'm mm. um, skeptical of, but yeah. becoming more and more comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. But um, pretty much everything. There's not much in the paranormal world um, that I haven't seen. Um, and wow. of course, there's always those incidences where it's kind of like when you're out Bigfoot hunting mm-hmm. and everybody's quiet and you're sitting down next to mm-hmm. each other and a twig breaks in back of you yeah. and the hair stands on end and you're immediate alert and you know, your heart's racing well you know it's probably a raccoon that snapped it but it's just the feeling and yeah you know just being out there and the excitement of getting to do what we do mm-hmm. that's cool so when you joined move on and began investigating i guess what was your first maybe uh, did you have a first aha kind of investigation or just a a cool one that you couldn't figure out that uh, you like in particular? There were uh, many investigations and, and when I first started out it was mostly on the phone. Mm-hmm. Of course my husband's active duty so we moved around about every two years we moved around a lot so it was hard to really settle into a state area mm-hmm. and you know get really comfortable and, and kind of make your name with the state director to where they trusted you with bigger cases and this mm-hmm. so I mostly did Lights in the Sky and phone interviews which was okay because I'm also busy and then eventually as you know I got older and many many years later and a decade and a half later I retired so now I have the time to investigate but any investigation is a good one if you get an answer Mm -hmm. and so my favorite ones are always when I can go to the witness and say you know what this is what happened and we had a classic case in memphis Mm -hmm. it's a great story because this lady was uh, very eccentric and she answered Mm -hmm. the door and the state director had called me and asked me if i would go as a star team manager to investigate something because she had this anomalous jelly that had dropped in her back deck and of course she believes this was remains of alien contact and could possibly be growing baby aliens. Oh, really? So it's like some kind of gel type stuff that was on the ground? Yes. So, you know, of course, I get in the car and I grab another star team investigator. We go out there and it was just a fun investigation because she opens the door. We're in Memphis, so of course there's uh, Elvis memorabilia everywhere. (laughs) And as I'm interviewing her, I realize, oh my gosh, I think that's her in the poster. So I asked her, I said, Suzanne, I said, is that you with Elvis in that movie poster? She said, yes, I did three movies with Elvis. Oh, my and gosh. And her name was Suzanne Lay. And huh. as we get talking further and further, then she relates to me that um, Vivian Lay is her aunt. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, she's famous for Gone with the Wind. Mm-hmm. And then she's relaying to me afterwards that she has been talking about her extraterrestrial suspicions and contact with uh, one of her very, very close friends out in Arizona. And um, it, it's just the connections. It was just really uh, funny how she was just really a, a charm. Mm-hmm. But we went out there and she showed me this this jelly and it was strange. I mm. was a little surprised. So we started looking at the trees to see if something like that. I am combing her grass, literally with a comb, her grass. <laughs> I'm trying to find another spot where this jelly could be because it's literally in the middle like it, and it looks like it had been dropped. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of a little shocked at how much more there was to this Mm -hmm. and a little credibility to what she's saying. So we take our samples and of course I send them to Phyllis Budinger Mm -hmm. at the time and Phyllis calls me, she said, Chase, I I did the analysis and I'm sending you the email, but I knew exactly what it was when you sent it. Mm -hmm. And she said, it's miracle Grow. when it gets Uh, wet, it hydrates and it's those chunks that mm-hmm. probably hydrated when it rained last night uh-huh. or the, the night before she had reported this. And then, of course, it's hot in Memphis, so it melted. Yeah. And sure enough, that's exactly what it was. And I remember as soon as she said that, I realized when we were doing the investigation, she had freshly potted plants all along a garden wall. Mm-hmm. And when I told her, of course, she really wanted the alien. So um, <laughs> she's like, well, I'll, I'll take the data, but I'm going to stick with my theory. <laughs> and I just thought that was wonderful. Uh-huh. But, you know, for me, that was an answer. Yeah. It was an alien, but it was a real, this is what we do as investigators. Mm-hmm. We follow the evidence and we give our witnesses what they're really looking for, the truth, mm-hmm. and then they can do with it as as they wish. Yeah. And it's funny how often that happens where you find a a substantial answer, Mm -hmm. but they're like, well, I kind of like my answer better. I'm going to stick with that, but thank you. Well, (laughs) and and the best friend that she was talking to all the time in Arizona, Mm -hmm. you know, Shirley, uh, she's talking to Shirley, and Shirley says, and Shirley, and I said, well, if you'd like me to talk to Shirley and send her this stuff, and she goes, oh, sure, here's her email, Shirley McLean. That's who I thought you were going at. That's you know, crazy. You know, you, know you, you just can't make this stuff up. I mean, yeah. This woman is amazing. Wow. And, you know, but Suzanne Lay was probably one of my favorite um, investigations out in Memphis, yeah. obviously. How cool. <laughs> yeah. I've always... Did you use the email? Um, actually, I did. And I got a, a little quick response oh, back good. of it, thanking me for, you know, attending to this and paying attention. And, uh, you know, she's, she was looking forward to hearing more from Suzanne and uh-huh. getting the data from her. So, oh, okay. yeah, it was, oh, it was a little cool. fun. Yeah. So you think your response was from Shirley McLean herself? I, you know, I hope so, because I wow. kind of believed it was. But, cool. you know, who knew? But yeah. it would have been easy to try to take advantage of yeah. that little small connection and contact yeah. her more. But... You know that you get busy, and yeah, yeah, you know, and that really wasn't what that was about. So mm-hmm. I'm sure she gets a lot of that. A lot of people think Shirley McLean is really wild, but I I really like her. I mean, she's a champion for those of us who believe in this stuff or at least work in this field, and I Absolutely. appreciate her for that. And uh, I've got some video interviews that she did that I think are really funny with uh, the Today Show that I've got up on YouTube, and they get tons of hits. But yeah, you either you people either think she's nuts or they love her. Well, and if you listen to what she's saying, it's a lot of the things we're finding today. Yeah. Some of the answers that ufologists yeah. we kind of all agree as a community. Yes, we believe this. Yes, this is done. Mm-hmm. And so she, you know, she blazed those trails for us yeah. when it wasn't cool. Mm-hmm. It's why I love those like Linda Moulton Howells and you know mm-hmm. some of the uh, researchers and investigators that have been out here when it was all pencil and pen and there yeah. was no internet and they really had to do the legwork. Mm-hmm. It, it was difficult, but they also tore down a lot of barriers for us. Yeah. 10 years ago, I was a crazy lady down the road that investigated UFOs mm-hmm. and now between the popularity of the topic on television shows and movies and you know the internet topics and, and the realities that people are waking up to, I'm like the coolest chick on the block. No, oh, really. Cool, huh? <laughs> Everyone wants to tell you, you know, the paranormal stories. Yeah. You know, it's great. And I want to get into more of the your investigations, but I guess I I really want to hear again because I thought it was great your bunko story. 
my Bunko story? How, you know. Oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and this is something that every once in a while, um, I still run into a little bit of that tongue-in-cheek, yeah. is what I call it. And I've noticed over the years that I've never been shy, embarrassed to tell anybody what I do. Which well, and that's why I love this story. Yeah, I'm a UFO investigator. And, of course, there's always that group of women because my other peer group is an officer, military, wives, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, arena. And sometimes they don't understand what I do, and they have their own preconceived notions of the whole UFO. And, again, the tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. And... You know, we had a little meeting, and she's going around the table, and everybody's talking about what they did for the weekend, and you know, uh, they, they're doing their little dogs, and they had this meeting, and um, talking about this charity, and, and the big bunko night. Let's not forget about the big bunko night Wednesday night, and there was a little cattiness and playful cattiness, because you know it doesn't get real ugly, of course, but okay. you know it was a little tease about Chase. Did you have any UFO visitations or any investigations? Have you done any of that this week? What have you been up to? <laughs> uh-huh. And it was clearly, you know, one of those moments where my answer immediately was, well, this week, or last week was amazing because I was in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Corps, uh, literally talking with military colonels and police officers and and astronauts and you know Mm -hmm. just going through the whole list and in in front of witnessing them talking and doing this big hearing in front of um, former congress uh, men and women and a senator gravel and i said so what did you do Mm -hmm. and of course you know my point had been made how did they react did they have some questions for you or were they kind of like Wow, but just uh, kind of overwhelmed. Sometimes people get overwhelmed. They don't know what to say after that. Yeah, I think there was a little chuckle, and, and, and it's almost like she took the medicine. You know what uh-huh. I mean? Like she's like, okay, and she kind of yeah. chuckled, and she goes, really, at the National Press Corps? Uh-huh. She goes right by D.C., by the Capitol, yeah. and she's like, who is there? And so it did. It opened the door for me to be able to explain mm-hmm. that, you know, come on, guys, there's, you know, a mainstream media perception mm-hmm. of our UFO witnesses and what investigators look like and do and you know um, Mm -hmm. I always think of Independence Day where you know the guy's drunk and you know they make him out to be a country boy and you know it's it's I think sometimes that's stuck in their head Mm -hmm. and the reality is not at all right we love our police officers our astronauts our pilots and our credentialed witnesses but I never forget the little 65 year old woman Mm -hmm. who's uh, grandmother lives on a farm and she would not lie to anybody mm. for any reason yeah so you know those are the people we're talking to sure yeah. every once in a while uh, we get somebody that you know um, may be wrong or you know maybe um, mistaken or or even you know in need of other types of help right but it's not as often as people would think it's, right. it's more rare than common mm-hmm. and even hoaxes I think what's interesting is people feel there's a lot of hoaxes but uh, usually that number when it comes to MUFON is pretty low percentage wise I've seen it down to five percent but it's usually below the ten percent I agree mm-hmm. I, I don't see a lot of hoaxing um, like the the type that we would be involved in as investigators mm-hmm. I see it on the internet you yeah. know you get the stories and oh, the yeah, gra- yeah. You know, uh, CGI but uh, as far as people reporting and purposefully hoaxing and bringing mm-hmm. people out you're right it is very rare yeah. I think. So in the event you were talking about at the Washington Press Club was a citizen hearing on disclosure. Yes. Which uh, you went to uh, part of it, and you said that that was a a kind of a life changer for you, at least. uh, had a strong effect. It did. A really big effect because you always want to present yourself well out here. And, of course, I was a MUFON for 18 years, so Mm -hmm. it was you're always conscious about representing the people that you're wearing their shirts or have got their IDs. You mm-hmm. want to do that do that well and do it right. But being independent since 2011, sincerely, you know, you really put a lot of effort into what we're doing out here. And I knew almost everybody personally. I've talked to them before, mm-hmm. um, friendly with them. And for the ones I didn't know, I've heard their stories. These are our witnesses these are this is our community our researchers that were sitting up there so my first really profound feeling was pride 
Mm. I was so proud to be a ufologist and 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 been here when again it wasn't cool. And watching these guys and you know I'm very close to Richard Dolan and Peter Robbins and some of them and their their right hand goes up and it was a striking moment for me because they meant it. Mm-hmm. And the panel listening meant it as well. And there was such a professionalism, and I felt that Stephen Bassett and everybody who worked there, everybody had a hand in that, raised that bar about three notches. And then it hit me, this isn't just about what they're doing as far as disclosure. They raised the bar for all of us. We all have to meet this new expectation and new goal, and that is uh, better casework. Um, How do we become better out here in the field? because the sense of pride for the researchers, you know, some of these guys, they're not boots on the ground. They don't go out to these, they're counting on us to collect that data Mm -hmm. and and get some of this information and and present it to our community to be examined and and tied in. We have to be better. And I just left feeling like, wow, you know, this is a game changer and I'm really gonna devote everything I have to meet those new expectations. Mm so getting into some of your investigation, so I there's a case of yours that's pretty famous, it seems like your most famous, where um, you actually were on an investigation where there were, you even saw some entities of some sort? Yes, and you know, this case, you know, and we're <laughs> friends, so I can say this, but it, sometimes it gets on my nerves because, <laughs> really? you know, everyone loves uh, it, but it, it is, it's a pretty big event, um, yeah. you know, I was... At, with MUFON at the time and Clifford Cliff the minute he heard what happened you know he called right away and of course he was the international director at the time and you know they just thought it was so significant so I understand the significance yeah. of it but that night drives me nuts because really? to this day I'm scratching my head like what, what the, hell? the heck was going on <laughs> nobody gets everything in one night it was uh-huh. ridiculous because huh. you know if so much was going on that to this day I'm not Sure, I'm 50-50 if it was even extraterrestrial Mm -hmm. or if it was government. What Mm -hmm. I will tell you is exactly what we saw was real. Mm -hmm. It happened. I just don't know which end because it's so bizarre. And um, there's a lot of details. So what did you see? Could you go from the beginning to the, tell us how it all came about? It's kind of long. I'll I'll kind of hit the hot spots for you, honestly. So, but, you know, I had a witness calling and he was reporting these orange orbs. Mm-hmm. that we know are epidemic all over the right. world and you know he was in contact I got assigned the case I started uh, talking to him and he was reporting uh, more and more activity there was one point uh, he and his cousins were chasing him down these dirt country roads late late at night high speeds trying to you know find more data or catch them or wow. whatever and he was talking about other things that were going on as well and I knew I needed to get out there We had planned an investigation, except we had this huge flood in Tennessee at the time. Mm. From Memphis to Nashville flooded, and it was crazy. The whole state was shut down. And so that set us back about 10 days until the waters receded, and I could even get to where he was. Very rural Tennessee. So rural, the sky looks amazing because there's no lights. Mm. It's that far away from anything else. So I get there finally to his property and almost immediately, you know, literally get out of the car and he's like, come on to the end of the driveway. And, you know, we look up and he's like, oh, here they come. And I look up and sure enough, the, you see these little lights in the sky popping up and they start to group together and then they start maneuvering, split apart, come to, you know, it just hmm. maneuvering in a way that it's just you're mesmerized like they, they can't do that they shouldn't be doing satellites don't do that um you know falling stars flares you know whatever um planes you know it's it's just you're looking and so i've got my ipad out and i'm checking you know satellite tracking even though we know that that's you know that's the nice mm-hmm. straight line that's usually the same time every night it was it was just crazy and when you got a little tired of this little group well look over mm-hmm. here here's another one mm-hmm. and then there's one over here well at this point the witness at, tells me that he has this huge cornfield and it's if we go down there there's a big panoramic view and that's usually where they see the most stuff yep let's go so we get in his truck we go down to the cornfield at this point the waters had receded it's it's not dried out but it's not really muddy 
And the corn's only about four or five inches, so it's pliable. We're not going to hurt the crop. We can go out in the cornfield. So you got this nice open space, and this little Rhode Island girl's, you know, jaws dropping like, mm -hmm. this is all your corn? This is all corn? Like, it was huge. Mm. And so we're kind of in the middle of this field, and it wasn't too long before he's clearly excited. He's like, Chase, Chase, Chase. Here it comes, here it comes. This is what I was hoping would happen. I, this is what I, I was hoping you'd see type of conversation and excitement. And um, I looked at where he was pointing, and sure enough, I see this light, and it's a white light, and it's coming closer and closer, and then two more show up, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we have three lights? This is awesome. About how high were they? Were they in the sky? If that is, yes, yes. Uh -huh. They were um, higher in the sky than the tree line, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. yeah, but not so high that it was like a plane to where you couldn't even tell what shape or anything it was. Mm -hmm. But as it's coming forward, you know, you, you're just noticing the way it's moving towards you is different. It's not floating, it's not flying, it's not drifting. It's it's so hard to describe this mm. movement. Well, I see the other two lights and, and then as it got closer, I'm like, oh my gosh, these aren't three objects, it's one. This is a friggin' triangle. Mm. Because now I'm starting to see the outline and the form of it. And I'm also starting to see as as it's closer, it blocking out some of the stars. Mm -hmm. And it was huge, absolutely huge. And my my jaws down. Obviously, as a UFO investigator, I'm trying to grab my cameras. I had four different makes and models. Nothing's working. I'm grabbing my tri field. Every, nothing. And I'm mad because <laughs> you know my first thought is, of course. Are you effing kidding? Right. It's I, I was it was crazy. It was yeah. a crazy frustrating moment. And you know, so I just looked and watched it and it literally flew over our heads and we watched it um, go out of sight. I think that was the first time I saw something where I was that close as a witness. Um, I've seen a lot of things I can't explain, but this was I knew at this moment I just saw a crash. Was there any sound or nothing? Mm -hmm. Nothing, and it, and it weird silence. It wasn't just quiet. Nothing. Wow. And as it flew over, I was looking at the other uh, investigator with me, star team um, investigator, and we're looking at each other like, "Are you serious?" I'm so excited. My heart is pounding. I mean, I'm ready to happy dance. I'm ready to you know, <laughs> yeah. shoot my whoop whoop and, you know, just have a great time. I, I, I can't believe it. The excitement was beyond surreal. And yet I have witnesses here, you yeah. know, and it's it's like, keep your composure. You're the professional. <laughs> this is why he called you out here. Yeah. And uh, it, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I turned my attention back to the equipment because I thought what had happened was um, something that's common, which is battery drain, mm -hmm. not only in UFOs, but paranormal, as you know. And when I started picking my equipment up, it was all back on. Wow. And I thought, well, did it was it jammed? Mm -hmm. Which is one of the indicators that later on became a very important clue. Mm. So I decided I'm changing the batteries anyway just to be safe. And the trifield meter, um, you need a little screwdriver to change a battery. So that's what I'm doing. I'm taking the battery case off, and all of a sudden I get this little paranoid feeling, and I kind of thought, ooh, you know. And I turned around and I asked the question, does anyone else feel like you're being watched? And I said, I don't mean up here, but down here. Mm -hmm. And before anyone could answer, it's your hit. It was physical. It was like a physical force that just hit you inside the core of your body and every single cell went into full-blown terror. Absolutely the most uncomfortable, horrific, horrible feeling. And it wasn't fight or flight. It wasn't, I'm really scared. It was full-blown. Every cell in my body understood what terror was. Mm -hmm. And I turned and just started running. Didn't think about it. We, we just, we reacted. It's like we were controlled. So you didn't even see anything at this point. You just Nothing. got hit with this fear and ran. Yes, it turned and ran. And when I did, I noticed the witness who was a little behind me at the time. He turned at the exact same time, same direction, and started running. And I also noticed the other people in the field doing the same thing. And that's a good point is wow. no one said, what's that, or run, or, 
you know, there was no indication. We all just did the exact same thing at the same time. Hmm. And there was a, a small thought. I don't remember thinking anything else during this time except, holy crap, I'm killing it, like running. I couldn't believe how fast I was going. It was, yeah. I don't think I ever ran that fast. Uh -huh. And again, I think it was, you know, that control thing. I, I just, mm -hmm. we weren't in control. Wow. And, I, and I was amazed at how fast I was running through this cornfield. And then I run into this, this like brick wall, bam, and I just stop. And I don't know how we were still standing up, but it turned out to be the witness. I couldn't believe how hard I hit. And the witness, um, he just said he had a flashlight. He was the only one with one. And it was kind of one of those big halogen ones. And it was in his left hand. And he said, what the F was that? And he swung his left hand out and literally six feet from us was this little being about three and a half foot tall and my first thought when I saw it was oh my god it's not that cute little Roswell alien <laughs> so professional of me I know it was horrible um, <laughs> oh my and he um so you're getting goosebumps just thinking about it now yeah it's it's it still bothers me just a bit when just you a say little. you hit a brick wall do you mean that figuratively you mean that you all of a sudden you stop no yeah i know i or you I, literally I, hit a wall no i yeah i just hit him i hit him so hard it, it i just couldn't believe like all of a sudden i'm running and then bam and it was him that i hit so yeah it was your partner no yeah the witness the witness okay yes. okay and and that's when you know we turned okay. and the flashlight you know you, my eyes just kind of went to the light gotcha. and as as his arm swung around it landed square on this little being and I, I i was so shocked something was standing there like what did it look like um it was very it was it looked like kind of a gray mm -hmm. um not exactly it wasn't like i said the cute little roswell alien it was about three and a half foot tall mm -hmm. um i remember being very focused on his legs for mm. some reason and and I, it's because they were so twig like and uh, like twig like like this this thick twig like, like it, very yeah like a like mm. a cord it's a good and of course i was worried because it didn't make sense and i i, I just thought it's not going to hold him up it was uh -huh. just a weird reaction to seeing a being it really was especially for somebody who's been hunting them for how long yeah and we just turned around I call it the one second um, that changed everything because the time that flashlight hit him and I saw him, it was one one thousand two. That's it. And that was it. And we were gone. Well, and so was its head? Did it have the big head and yes. the little body? Mm -hmm. and did it have big black eyes? Like, yes, absolutely. Really? Not the big, you Wrap know. Around. Yes, but they were larger and they were black. And the thing that struck me too is how do you go from that dark? That cornfield was dark. There's uh -huh. no lights. All we had were the stars, you know, and a, fl a couple flashlights, and you know, had your uh, phone lights up and some of your equipment, and that was enough. Mm -hmm. How do you go from that dark to this creature having a halogen flashlight? Literally, his arm, you know, closed the gap. What about two more feet? Four feet. This big thing smack in your face, and not a glitch. Not a movement, not a twitch, not a, you know. It didn't move at all. Nothing. Hmm. And at first, I kind of described it as it it reacted very mechanically, mm -hmm. like it had to have been a machine, and yet everything I saw on the outside was, looked biological. Mm -hmm. Of course, later on in the investigation, you know, we go back because I'm thinking, all right, wait a minute. Could they have put the, you know, the cousins kind of come out and put the being there mm -hmm. and, you know, and, you know, we'll address that in a little bit too. But at this point, we're running again and literally get into his truck. We're all piling in. We leave that cornfield so fast. I literally, all four tires were off to get onto that main road. It, we, he was just gone. Wow. We finally get in his driveway and we're all piling out and I, I I know I was the first one that was just like I think I just kind of giggled like like what the hell just happened like yeah. what was that and at this point I realized that that fear somewhere along the way had vanished um, mm. I was starting to feel very normal again you know senses coming back on and I'm thinking to myself oh my gosh we need to get back I could have physical evidence you know there was a being out there and mm -hmm. you know but this is going on in my head and 
but I, I knew the first thing I said out loud really was, all right, guys, I, you know, I looked at the other investigator, I said, we need to call the state director because we had now just become uh, witnesses ourselves. We mm -hmm. can't talk about it until we are interviewed separately. Oh, yeah, so, great. Yeah. Well, a great way to have your wits about you. Well, that yeah, that did, that mm -hmm. wasn't so witty when I'm running like a little girl in that <laughs> yeah. cornfield. I'll tell you, it's embarrassing. But honestly, there's just no control. Yeah. It, this wasn't us. Um, I'm not a runner. I, I think anyone that knows me and has spent any time with me would know that I'm not afraid of this. Um, but you were booking through that field. Like the craziest little girl, like <laughs> could have been screaming. Who knows? Yeah. You know, it was ridiculous. It's, it's comical to, to think about all of us doing this. And yeah. even the witness, when we first pulled up there, pulled out a big shotgun. Wow. And I kind of looked at him, meeting him a whole, what, 20 minutes ago, so to speak. And, you know, and he's like, no, 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 Chase. You know, uh, we have a problem with coyotes out here. So I have this just in case, you know, they run up on us, I can take care of it. Mm -hmm. This is not a guy who said, be ready, you know, if the coyotes come, jump in the truck and we're going to, he mm -hmm. had a gun. This is his backyard. Yeah. These are people that don't dial 911. Mm -hmm. They take care of what's going on. We weren't the runners. And so um, the other investigator kind of walked down the driveway just a bit, a little privacy while she talked to the state director. And that's when the witness came up to me and he was clearly shaken up a little, um, a little relieved, and there's a lot of motion, and you could tell that it was starting to hit him. And he gets down on a knee, and he's like, Chase, thank you so much for coming. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, like, it meant everything. And it was then I realized it was important to him that we we saw this because now we're the unbiased witnesses mm -hmm. not his wife or his friend or yeah. you know that just says yeah yeah I saw it too yeah it's good or mm -hmm. well I didn't see it honey but I know you're telling me you know we're yeah. the investigators and, and that was important to him and the second thing he said was you saw that right and I, I looked at him and I said yes I did he said what what was it I can't I can't talk about it and so I just looked at him, and the first thing that came to me was, it was real. Mm -hmm. And then he asked a question that I think kind of shook up a few things anyway. Um, and he looked at me and goes, what did they want? And I'm thinking, they? I didn't see they. I saw it. Yeah. What are you talking about, they? <laughs> and then I realized. There's more. Let's yeah, get out of here. Exactly. <laughs> then I realized at this point that he just meant they as in mm -hmm. general. And there was a moment a little bit after that that I'm thinking, OMG, what time is it? And I mm. grabbed my cell phone and I'm thinking, if it's two hours later than it should be, I'm yeah. done. I'm going home right now. <laughs> and <laughs> and I looked and the time was exactly as it should have been. So okay. that was a big relief. But, you know, I think, you know, there was more. We definitely were back out in that field, thir you know, less than 30 minutes mm -hmm. after this event. Um, not even worried about running at this point. It was clear we were controlled. We were supposed to be out of there. Mm. None of us did this on purpose. Um, nothing scared me to experience that kind of terror. This was not fight or flight. Times it by a thousand and feel it. It, it sounds crazy. I, you know, like when your feet fall asleep and the tingling. Mm -hmm. That's fear, but you feel it everywhere in your body. You are that charged with wow. something, yeah. and it's horrific. It's fascinating. Well, I know they do have uh, non-lethal weapons where, for instance, they can shoot these waves at you and you feel like you're on fire mm -hmm. and they use it for crowd dispersal. Uh, they yes. haven't used it in the country as far as I know, but I know that it exists. So You're absolutely right. And yeah. this is why to this day I don't say it was extraterrestrial because there were several things that just don't make sense. First of mm. all, nobody gets everything in one night. It was too perfect. Mm. Um, that's, I, that's what I couldn't shake, the feeling that something's off. And usually when investigators you know, like us have that, it's, it's that sixth sense. It's our gut telling us something's off. Yeah. Um, number two, the being didn't make sense. Us running definitely didn't make sense. There was a lot of things wrong. and. The other part was the equipment that I thought had a, nat uh, a battery drain that we know is a phenomena. How many times do you hear uh, the technology of extraterrestrial contact or close to you jammed your equipment? Mm -hmm. That sounds like us. Yeah. 
So, you know, today I'm 50-50. I'm yeah. still up for it. And um, there's why the government would use us as an experiment. Why would they know I was going out at that time? Was I personally selected? I'm not that special. So that's what takes that out of the equation. Yeah. So it's still this really odd case that I almost hate going to and addressing again. And I, it's been a few years now, so the only time I really think about it is every once in a while, you guys, I'll be in a car and just driving by myself and it's a dark, dark road, um, a highway or, you know, 95. And I get a little twinge of just a tiny little dose of what, like a 1% of what that felt like. Mm -hmm. And it makes me sick to my stomach and I'm I'm very nervous. And I will actually pull off on the side, get out of my car, shake it off, get fresh air, walk it out a little bit. It's, um, I I don't want to feel that again. It was Mm -hmm. horrid. But that's really the only thing left, you Mm -hmm. know, so. Still, still debating what happened in that yeah. stupid cornfield. So, of course, the joke <laughs> yeah. with all my friends now is, you know, they know I hate those cornfields. <laughs> yeah. That is really funny, too, because I, I do understand how you feel about the case because I have at least one case where I feel the same. It's fascinating, but I don't even like to discuss it when people bring it up, but, of course, people want to. Yeah. And so, and I'm not even going to talk about what case that is because <laughs> people will probably know anyway. But, um uh, so at the time you were the star team manager? Oh, that, at the time of this case? Right, yeah. No. Okay, no. you were a star team it investigator. Was, and that case got written up right in the MUFON journal and everything. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. It was it thoroughly investigated. The state director was out the very next day. You know, mm-hmm. We spent pretty much the whole day out there um, you know, doing the interviews, getting everybody's mm-hmm. you know, testimony. Uh, back out in daylight, of course, I'm looking, because I did go back to look to see if there was tracks from that being. I was looking for some sort of physical or trace Mm -hmm. evidence. I could track every move we made out there, every footprint we made. I could tell where the Mm -hmm. incident happened, where, you know, we stopped and, you know, saw this. It was, I found everything except prints. So it kind of ruled out the hoax of, you know, them Mm -hmm. putting a being out there, or they'd have to come back and get it. Yeah. And in the dark, there's no way they're going to, you know, walk backwards and trace art. Right. You know, it's just, it, you know. So you didn't find any evidence mm-mm. of that. And no. um, the witness who you were with certainly seemed like they had a genuine experience. I mean, they weren't hoaxing. No. And, you know, it changed everything. Um, the other investigator left the field. Wow. Soon, soon after that. Yeah. Uh, the witnesses completely um, kind of shut down a little. Wow. Not not so much the family did. In fact, the last uh, the last kind of time where we're starting to tie things up, and the wife pulled me aside and she said, "Chase, I can't talk to you for a moment." I'm like, "Oh sure, oh sure," because you get kind of close to a family. Mm-hmm. I try not to do that because they don't need a new friend. They yeah. need an investigator. Yeah. So I try to maintain that very professional. But the investigator, especially when they confirm that something strange is going on, it becomes a really important person to them yes. in their life. And we shared something yeah. that, you know, as far as I know, I, many people have uh, told me I know that fear or I felt mm-hmm. this or, you know, had something similar. But, you know, to have somebody that experienced that with you at the time, mm-hmm. it is important. But his wife uh, pulled me aside, and and I knew where this was going. She was not happy with all the, you know, extra investigators and, Mm. you know, just kind of a little circus atmosphere that was starting to develop Mm. that I promised wouldn't happen. I see. And if they they let us come out and investigate. So, you know, it's one of those things. But she she literally pulled me aside and said, "Um, do you know what this is? Can can you tell me what's going on? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, I can't tell you that it's a triangle from ladies, you right. know, and that you're being abducted or Yeah. So I said, Well, I could give you some answers, I said, but I can't tell you exactly and then she said, Can you stop it? Mhm. And I'm like, No ma'am And I knew exactly where she was going yeah. and she's like, I need time to get my family back. My husband is obsessed with these every single night yeah. and she asked me if I was married and had children, of course the answer is yes. Yeah. And she says, Then you're gonna understand I need you guys not to come back for a while. I need to bring my family back together, bring some normalcy. And it didn't matter how great of an investigator this guy had. Right. Nobody could take Mm -hmm. care of him better than his wife. 
especially in these times that she needed to hone things back in. I completely understood. Mm -hmm. And so I let him know that I pretty much had done everything I can at this point. Yeah. You have my number. If you guys ever need me, I'll be here. And over the years and over the months, you know, it went from calling a couple times a week to once a week to every two weeks or month. And now I think the last time I heard, I got a text message, hey, just making sure I still have your number. And I sent mm -hmm. back a text saying, uh, I will always keep this number, and if by chance, for some reason, I have to change it, you'll be the first one I make sure has yeah. it. And that was it. Yeah. And I mean, with paranormal investigation, that's often all that can happen is you can share in the experience or help confirm uh, the reality of the experience, but that's all you can do. Right. Can't give answers, and uh, sometimes they're satisfied, and they appreciate that aspect. Yes. Sometimes it turns, and they get really upset that you can't do more. Exactly. And, you know, we could confirm at least he had real phenomena, and that's exactly right. what you just right. said. But, and, and you know. It's hard. The reality is we can never say, yeah. you're being abducted by, you know, mm -hmm. reptilians or whatever it is. It's, yeah. it's a very delicate balance as investigators because we w want to only focus on mm -hmm. evidence. We can't. I don't have the luxury to, you know, talk a lot about theory with them yeah. and, you know, I have to leave all of my preconceived notions and my beliefs outside. Mm -hmm. And very often I am confronted with things that don't fit in there anyway, so it's a good thing I left it out yeah. because then I'm open-minded enough to understand, okay, this may be a clue, this may be a new lead, mm -hmm. but that's what we do as investigators is we collect data, we're collecting interviews, we're collecting yeah. pieces of a puzzle that very often I bring to other people like Richard or you know other researchers or yeah. lab techs or certified professionals um, especially in abductions I'll go in take the initial interviews and uh, gather as much data and then I find them the most perfect professional yeah. that deals with them long term yeah so I kind of more of a first responder I think yeah. So I want to th thank you so much for sharing that story. You're it's absolutely fascinating. It's great to hear from, from you personally, especially having known you now. Um, but I really want to get into, and I know the listeners want to hear be, uh, around uh, some of the MUFON stuff as well, because um, as we talked about earlier, you, you it, online you've become like the champion for the anti-MUFON. And so, but you were part of MUFON, you were a star team manager, is that correct? It was, and uh -huh. a star team manager and deputy director of investigations. Yeah. And it was an awesome role. I was uh -huh. with them as a field investigator, and sometimes just a journal subscriber, and I don't mean just a journal subscriber as less than. Right. But, you know, there were times when I lived in Guam, and, you know, right. it was... Um, Which means you're not volunteering as much, but you're still subscribing and a member. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I love MUFON, and mm -hmm. I was thrilled to get that job. And that's something I've always been very public with. I love being the SAR team manager. I love that job. I was shocked when I got it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I had a chance at Hades, but I filled out an application because this was now the board of directors vetted and personally selected. You weren't mm -hmm. just assigned by a person. Well, you're our new star team manager. So, yeah. you know, this was, it, it, I, I felt like, oh my gosh, and I really was going to do it right. Um, this was right after the Bigelow contract, so there was a lot of suspicion, and, you know, no one really wanted to work with the star team. and. Uh -huh. I worked really hard, personal phone calls, uh, networking with state directors and making promises. This is going to be transparent, we're going to be up front, we're going to be a rock star team because mm -hmm. we're going to do this and we're going to be focused and I promise you guys we're going to do this right. And slowly and surely I was gaining that confidence and gaining the trust because more and more states were jumping on board wanting to be part and participate in the star team program mm -hmm. because they didn't want to make it mandatory that it's a move on program right. and I don't think people realize that that when I redid this entire program from the old Bigelow where it was all paid and 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 you know controlled in a different way I designed a completely different program that was a national response that was going to work that included state directors I wrote the policies the procedures the whole program and it was working um, and people a lot of MUFON members mistrusted they did not trust the star team agenda 
mm-hmm. and we're gaining it because they knew I was truthful. They they could hear the passion. I they knew I was telling the truth. I'm not going to do this, guys. I'm going to stay up front, and we're winning. And then we just had an incident where you know there was a couple people in play at the time in headquarters that absolutely put my back against the wall to where I'd have to cover up something that just happened between us at headquarters mm-hmm. or I'd have to lie about it and I wasn't going to do that. Lie about it? You know, mm-hmm. where it's, uh, I was actually told, you don't talk about this and if anyone asks, you don't say anything. Mm-hmm. And my integrity was not for sale or rent. Yeah. And But I have never, and I, and I love how you brought this up, I, I really, really appreciate this. I've never bashed MUFON. I have called out this bad behavior by just a couple of them, mm-hmm. whom, by the way, aren't there anymore. Right. So it was something that maybe needed time to, you know, resolve itself. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of people just, you know, for every Chase Kletsky that, you know, the title, the star team manager title got the attention. It was just me that was attached to it. Yeah. But for every Chase Kletsky that, that left, and it was a big deal in this big hoopla, there were 10 people that also were fired, let go, put on investigate, you know, from this one person. Mm-hmm. It, was a, it was a really difficult time. And, you know, true as any corporate, you know, or big organization, even big volunteer organizations, it takes a while for all of that to filter through, get through the truth, is what's really yeah. going on, you know, to the guys that can actually do something about it. And, you know, I... So I guess I, I think it'd be fair to characterize it as that person that you had issue with. Yes. Um, the leadership also felt that this person wasn't headed in the right direction, and that person was let go. Well, I assume, because mm-hmm. she's not there anymore. Okay. However... Um, you know, at that time, there was nothing I could do about it. I couldn't yeah. get around her, and she set it up that way. Yeah. So, you know, and that was fine, but it, it was a difficult situation. I was mm-hmm. devastated, devastated leaving move on, and I was very public about that even right after. I didn't speak about my resignation, I think, for six months, and then Jerry Pippen was doing a show with Elaine Douglas, mm-hmm. um, uh, Marilyn Carlson, and a bunch of other people uh, that were let go of move on because for a while it seemed like the women the strong women, the women that were doing things and move on. You know, we had um, one, two, three, four, five, six state directors, all female, fired within a week. Wow. Let go. Like, they had yeah. no clue anything was going on. They get a letter. You are no longer in move on. Mm-hmm. And everybody was going crazy. Mm-hmm. But for every one of us, there were 10 more. Mm-hmm. And very good people um, even stuck up for me and what happened because I was very very honest um, I don't really like to get into the details now because honestly yeah. ancient, ancient history yeah it's water under the bridge what I do want to ask around that um, is that did you feel ever that you know what the actions that person was taking were uh, under the uh, guidance or orders of the government or some kind of nefarious conspiracy or something like that? Yes, I go back and forth with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I do believe that she had some sort of agenda. However, my problem with her was, um, I don't know, I think it was different. I, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to say too much because my opinion of her is very low mm-hmm. and I'd rather, you know, kind of keep more of that because again, it's ancient history. Right, She's right, not even right. with them anymore. Um, but I'm glad you're asking this because you're right. Uh, even after I left, um, Elaine Douglas and, and the people that wanted to reform MUFON were all over me. She even traveled from Utah where she lived. She heard I was in Oklahoma, traveled down to see me to personally, you know, convince me to join their cause. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to hurt MUFON. Yeah. You know, I didn't think MUFON needed all that referee. <laughs> you know, I tell you what, a few of these people in there doing things they're not supposed to and using the MUFON organization, yeah, let's get rid of them. <laughs> you right, know, right. but you know, all these other things, and you know, MUFON could could upgrade a little, you mm-hmm. know, in some of their policies, and you know, un there's a lot of discussion right now out in the community that Jan Harzan is doing exactly that. Mm-hmm. He's upgrading, he's modernized a lot of the policies. Uh, there's a, a very 
bright future there's a plan he can tell you where they want to be in two years that we never hear that and move on and all the time i was there it was always you know reacting but um we've all been paying attention to jan harzan for quite some time mm -hmm. and the other thing we've seen are all the people that he has reached out to that um the headquarters the doi staff and that they have reached out to inviting people back mending fences and mm -hmm. you know it was really good to see it really yeah. was and of course there's you know my friends richard dolan yeah. absolutely respects and likes jan harzan very much so we've been watching him quite a bit yeah i guess uh one of the questions i want to ask and and uh because it's kind of uh was uh, suggested i ask is if you had because you know i i've been behind the scenes with them and i haven't seen any ties with anything um you know dodgy in that somebody getting orders or something certainly very differing opinions and and i think everybody in move on would rather see just like anybody in any organization you'd rather see this way or that way do you have any if you were to say well i think there is some government connection or something and you ought to go look at this have you seen evidence of that is there something that you think um is there that hasn't been uncovered yet I don't think there's something within MUFON that isn't known mm -hmm. or hasn't been uncovered, but um, I do believe that obviously if you're doing this right, we all kind of joke as ufologists, if you're not on at least two watch lists, uh -huh. you know, then you're not really doing your job well enough. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a joke and right. uh, none of us want to be on those lists. but when all is said and done in a way we do because it means we're doing good exactly <laughs> but ufos are a national security issue yeah. and you have an international organization that's getting the majority of reports from civilians all over the world and um when i say civilians other than us you know mm -hmm. meaning you ufologists and it, it's just crazy if you were the government and wanted to know what was going on or what are the trends or where are they spotting even our technology uh what where we got R&D, what are we testing in the skies? What are they reporting about that object that we know is ours? They don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. You know, of course you're going to go to MUFON. Yeah. And if you're and and I'm if you're an aerospace company, would you not be interested in the next propulsion yeah. or you know how they could transverse or the nuts and bolts, how they communicate? I, I, all of this is very very important technology. Obviously, MUFON, just like all the other UFO organizations, mm -hmm. obviously have people in there that have their own agenda. Yeah. I never, ever once believed it was a MUFON agenda. I believe that there were some that very easily could have their own agenda and using MUFON in the process. Mm -hmm. it, it, to me, that, that it actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to be able to find and fetter these people out? No. But if you're putting these reports out anyway... Uh, I, I'm working in metals case right now, and somebody said, "Well, you know, what if, what if this metal that is really presenting some cool stuff? I'll say it like that. Well, what if somebody patents it? I don't care. The whole world's going to see it. Yeah. So you know, when you think of if MUFON's database, if it's open to the public and anybody can go in and look at a case, yeah, where's the secret? And that's a, that's exactly a great point because I feel that way about my computer or whatever. As if they're looking at my computer, that's great because they're going to read it on my website soon. As soon as I can get it up there anyway, because uh, that's the whole point. So we're sharing information. And and we kind of joke about you know the, yeah. we're doing our job if we know the government's poking yeah. at us. So if we if we suspect that that's happening with MUFON, now all of a sudden it's a big deal. Yeah. You know, like we you know that they're doing something wrong but we're cool yeah you know it's well we are have it both running ways. out of time because we're going to get kicked out of this room pretty soon nice. so <laughs> we better wrap it up thank you so much i'm sure there's going to be people saying you should have asked her this you should have asked her that which is fine because that just gives us an excuse to talk maybe in a few months again i would love to come back yeah because i think uh uh, we'll stay in contact now that we know each other well, and uh, it's been so much fun uh, seeing you this weekend and everything. So I guess my last question to wrap up is, where do people go to see some of your information, and what's in store for the future for you? The future is definitely more investigations. I'm finishing up um, a couple metal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, got some things. Right now, my initial future is about three weeks off. 
after I leave this event, uh, you know, it's been a crazy, crazy year. You know, as you know, I've done 11 investigations in uh, nine states, three countries. So um, I'm still working on how to present my information. I've usually been just going on radio shows and, and mm -hmm. talking about it. I need to get a web page set up. Um, it, it's, you know, but they can find me at you know, chaseklutsky.com. Find me on Facebook, Twitter. I mm -hmm. love to network. Like, cool. yeah, love it. I so see good. you on Facebook a lot. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. All right, Greg, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much to Chase for sharing this fascinating story. I got to say, this case where she's, she's talking about is one of the most fascinating stories I've heard in a long time. I think that uh, I would not be as excited about it had I not met Chase and spoken with her directly. And now I just think it's incredible. So, and I'm just as baffled as she is. You know, what the heck is going on there? So, really great case. Uh, very, like I said, you know, I can, I'm not talking enough about uh, what a great pleasure it was to meet Chase. Uh, she's, she's a really great researcher, really great person. So, um, I'm very happy to have her on the show, and uh, I'm glad I took Richard Dolan's advice and uh, spoke with her. Uh, you can see more about Chase at chasekletzky.com, and that last name is K-L-O-E-T-Z-K-E, K-L-O-E-T-Z-K-E. -E. So you could Google her name and you'll find it or uh, attempt to uh, write that all out, Chase Kletsky.com. So thank you so much to Chase. I'm sure we'll be uh, working and talking with her more. Uh, she also did a great presentation. She talked about the Peruvian skulls uh, and uh, some of her research into that. She's actually gone out and done some field work there. And uh, she was a great speaker. She was also involved with uh, a panel or two and uh, she held her own. Uh, she was not afraid to speak her, her point of view, even if it was counter that of some of the other uh, researchers and hosts of the event. So it's great that she felt confident enough to do so. And she did it in a, a diplomatic, professional way. So um, it was great. She, uh, she did a good job. So uh, way to go, Chase. Thank you all for joining us. Be sure to check out all of this, uh, these stories we've been talking about at openminds.tv. And of course, uh, some of these, you know, are some exciting developments, the Tom Carey photos and such. So you can follow us and, uh, at openminds.tv and we'll give you updates on all of this. Also, you can go find us on Facebook and uh, on uh, Twitter and uh, there we will have some more information as well. I know there's a lot of hubbub going on about the background here and uh, actually, you know, if you look at our Facebook and we'll write some more about this eventually, but uh, there was a little bit of buzz about these pictures a few months ago. Uh, actually, when uh, it kind of came to light, some, some a little bit of information was leaked. So we will wait excitedly to hear more about that. Actually, I'm going to be speaking with Tom or, or Don Schmidt this weekend. He's going to be here in Phoenix for Phoenix MUFON, and uh, I'm, I'll be interviewing him soon. So we'll have more information on these photographs uh, that are coming out. Also, of course, Spacing Out, you can check out Spacing Out, comes out every Friday. We just had a new one. Uh, they're doing very well, and people love to see Jason and Maureen and I uh, doing our thing on YouTube. Also, we will have more information on the UFO Congress coming out. We've got our speaker list pretty much solid, and that's really exciting. Tickets are selling really fast, so if you don't have a room, check out the hotel or get one at a nearby hotel because even the nearby hotels sold out last year. And this year is even more exciting because we have uh, Bob Lazar and his first really big public appearance and George Knapp will be there as well. We have other great speakers. We have Joan Bird, who I saw this weekend, wrote the book on UFOs in Montana. We have uh, a couple of people talking about UFOs in New York. In particular, Linda Zimmerman is talking about the Hudson Valley, and um, that's going to be really exciting. There's a documentary based on that that you might have seen. Richard Dolan, everybody really 
had a lot to say about the interview that we did last week, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and Richard and I have been discussing that online. He's a great guy, a, a lot of fun to listen to, and he'll be at the conference. So we have a lot of really exciting stuff going on. So check out UFO congress.com and be sure to register for the conference as soon as possible it's it's entirely possible we're going to sell out uh we only have limited space and we actually do fill that room uh for some of this talk so it's entirely possible maybe even probable that we're going to sell out so get your tickets as soon as possible at ufocongress.com one other thing I do want to mention is our video on demand. We do have video on demand. So all of our past conferences, what we've started with is 2010. We're putting all of these videos up online so you can go rent them for a very low fee. Or you can get a monthly membership for just a few bucks a month and you have access to all of those videos. We're adding more and more videos every month and we already have quite a few up there of uh, some of the past lectures. So this is a great way. A lot of people love these lectures where you can go online and watch them to your heart's content and uh, get more and more videos every month. So it's kind of exciting. It's like our private little Netflix. So uh, video on demand, you can go to openminds.tv and you'll see banners all over the place, but you'll see a, a big one right on the top of the page on the upper right. You'll be able to check that out. So uh, go look at that. And thank you all. For listening, thank you to Caleb Hanks for doing the open and close music. You can find him at clerkchronicles.com. You can also find a link to him on our radio page as well as to the PSN network. Thank you for also playing the show. Hello to everybody who's listening there.